Welcome into the Trevor Stop Show, episode number 17. Today we have a great guest. We've got Ezra Aderhold coming onto the show. Ezra's going to talk to us about his season so far this year, as well as his crazy diet and fitness routine. So let's jump right into it. All right, and we're welcoming into the show now our guest for today, Ezra Aderhold. Ezra, thank you so much for joining the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Trevor. Absolutely. So I want to start kind of just talking this season a little bit before we get into some other stuff. Um, so right now you're 13th in the pro tour standings, had a pretty consistent season, had a few shaky events towards the beginning, but you've kind of settled in now. Um, you've had quite a few, you know, you've kind of been floating around in the top 20, had a top five, a few top tens. Um, would you say that you're happy with the way things have gone so far? Um, I wouldn't say happy. I'm not too disappointed. I mean, it's been, it's been kind of consistent, like you've said, so I haven't really had like that pop off event that I'm kind of looking for. It's been, it's been pretty steady. I've had a couple bad events, like you said, as well, but <clears throat> to be thought into the standings is pretty decent. I feel like with this, this season's field. Um, so I, I can't complain too much, but you know, the way my game's progressing, I feel like that, that top, top five, top three, even maybe a, a win is probably somewhat close. So I'm excited. Yeah, for the, for the season. definitely. And I, I would say that, you know, coming off of the, your last couple seasons being on tour, um, because you're obviously, this is still, you know, what is this your third season on, on the pro tour now? It is. Yeah. Yeah, so you're still pretty new to the tour. Um, I, I think your game has certainly progressed, especially even just from last season. What do you feel like you've had going for you this season that you that you've improved on the most? That's getting you closer to that winner's circle. Um, you know, my my forehand is a lot better than it was last year. I had a lot of issues with nose angle and, and wobble, and my my forehand's been coming out a lot cleaner. I've put a lot of time into that. Mm -hmm. you know, I put a lot of time into anhydrous releases last off season, so that's that's been improved. Um, honestly, I feel like my mental game has improved a lot. I think that's, um, kind of a big reason why my consistency has been so much better this season, just kind of maintaining okay. a, a kind of, kind of a positive attitude and kind of moving forward after every shot and trying to forget about the, the past holes as quickly as possible. Um, so I think that's, yeah. that's probably been maybe the biggest thing for, for this season. Yeah. Do you find with your mental game? Cause I know like a lot of people throw out the term mental game, obviously golf is, you know, a lot of people say 80% mental is like the, the coined term at this point, but yeah. so many people talk about mental game. A lot of people are talking about just nerves. Some people, uh, like you mentioned, have to work on things like staying in the moment. Do you find that for your, for yourself? And when you talk about improving your mental game, is that where it really comes into play is, is staying in the moment and having a short memory? Is that, does like frustration build up for you or do you find it in other things too, as far as like nerves when putting and, and things like that? Yeah. I mean, I think for me personally, it's, it's mostly kind of the attitude thing. It's too easy for me to have a bad hole and then get really frustrated. Um, just knowing that like I'm two shots off of what I should be or three shots off of what I should be if I would have just yeah. stayed in bounds or whatever it is. So that's kind of the biggest thing for me is, is like, it's like you said, kind of staying in the moment and just focusing on the next shot. Um, focus is, is, is usually pretty, you know, not, not super difficult for me. And then things like nerves, um, and you know, uh, anxiety or whatever, like, like that, I kind of like, I kind of like feeling those emotions on the course. You know, it's, it's not every day that I get to feel those feelings. So when I'm in those yeah. pressure situations, like I kind of like that and I kind of, I can kind of feed off of that a little bit. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of, yeah. well, and that's, that's more, more positive. <laughs> That's why you're on tour and, and I'm here interviewing you because some <laughs> certainly being able to, to take those uh, feelings of nervousness as a positive is a huge part of, of having that killer mentality and being able to win when it's time to do that. Um, as far as the rest of the season is concerned, obviously you said there's still some things that you're hoping to accomplish. Are there any specific goals that you set for yourself for the remainder of the season or is it kind of just generally looking to improve? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't set necessarily specific goals like, like that. Um, I mean, I think... If I could win every tournament from now on, that'd be that'd be a successful yeah. season. That's sure, what I'm sure. ambitious. I, I, I'm just trying to you know improve as much as I can and 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 focus on each shot and not um, yeah not not think too far in advance. Kind of just try to t try to do as best I can you know in each moment. So if I could pick up a win this season, that'd be awesome. If I could pick up some more top tens and maybe finish in the top ten on you know for the actual Pro 12 standings, that'd be that'd be a, a good accomplishment as well. Definitely and. So if you were able to pick up, let's just say you're able to pick up a, a win for the remainder of the season, it's certainly within the possibility. Looking at the remaining schedule, what's the one event left on the calendar that you'd really want to win if you could only pick one? Um, yeah. I mean, obviously, obviously, any major is going to be you know, a, a good win. If I could win Wolves, that'd be fantastic. Um, but I think you know, if I had to pick ones that I'd have a, you know, the kind of the best shot at, um, I think Prisolve comes to mind. That that course really suits up to my game, and I've played well in the, well there on the past. 
um, as well as D-Glo. That's another one. Um, I think, honestly, I think USDGC, I think I'd have a good chance. I've, I've played well there on the past, and I feel like mm-hmm. I, I typically do a little bit better um, at, at the majors, at the big events. So I think... I think if I, you know, if I stick to my game plan, stay in bounds, make my putts at USEGC, I think that could be that could be a, a good kind of full swing. Yeah. So, so talking about you mentioned like court, the preserve course kind of fits your game and other courses. Yeah. What it, when you're looking at course, what is it that you see that you think that it really matches up to your game well? What are the kind of shots or, um, you know, whether it be certain hazards or certain conditions? What are you kind of looking at that makes you feel confident in a course? Yeah. Uh, the, the the main thing is length. You know, I think I'm one of the one of the further guys on tour. So if I have if I have kind of room to throw the disc as far as I want and not worry too much about you know aim, that helps a little bit. Um, sure. Obviously, I'm confident in my abilities and I can obviously play well in more wooded courses and and you know if those OB and stuff like that. But it's a little bit easier for me to play well or place well at least if uh, if I have a little bit more freedom off the tee and just kind of throw as far as I want, throw some short up shots. And then um, have some putts. So that's where you know Prisolve comes to mind. Deglo, um, Jones, Gross, courses like that. Well, it, it definitely helps to to have some more distance. Absolutely, and kind of backing it up a little bit. Obviously, you're you're having some success on tour in recent years, but and a lot of people, you know, you become pretty quickly a household name on tour. You know, you're in the top fifteen right now in the Pro Tour. I'll, um, become pretty popular player, but a lot of people probably don't realize that you only became uh, a PDGA member in 2019. You know, you haven't really been on the scene for too long. Um, mm. And people might not even also know that disc golf almost didn't even become your thing. Out of high school, you were looking to be a real estate mogul and uh, flip houses. So talk a little bit about that, you know, what made you want to think about doing that and then what kind of got you thinking, mm, maybe this isn't for me. Yeah. Yeah, so in high school, actually, I plan on going to college, um, and then I read a book called Rich Dad Poor Dad, and it was like, yeah. it seems like it's way easier to make money in real estate and just be my own boss and, and kind of have freedom in that sense. So then, yeah, out of high school, my, my brother and I bought some houses and fixed them up and and sold them, and we made I mean we made decent money. It's not like you know it's not like we didn't it's not like we failed or anything, but it was just it was a lot of, a lot of time walking and it wasn't super fun. And I wasn't I just I found out that I wasn't super passionate about it. And kind of yeah. realized that even with a bunch of money, you start to do something with your time, you know. So it was like, sure. I might as well, might as well go to do something that's that's a little bit more fun. I liked disc golf at the time; I hadn't put a ton of time into it. But I figured traveling around playing disc golf events would be a lot more fun. And if I, you know, if it, if I didn't make any money doing it, I can always go back to real estate when I'm fifty and and make money at that time. So, you know, kind right, of decided definitely. to go the disc golf out. Right. And and by the time you became a PDJ member in 2019, you kind of hit the ground running competitively. How much preparation, how many years or how much time of preparation went into your game before? Because a lot of people, when they get into disc golf, they get into the tournaments really quickly and, and start competing. But for you, you kind of had a period of preparation. How how long was that before you decided to start competing? Yeah. So 20, let's see, 2016 was the year I did the houses. So I think 2017 was kind of like the beginning of 2017 is when I decided I wanted to, to make disc golf my career and, and, and try to, you know, make that path successful. So it was like two years where I, I really focused a lot on, on technique and trying to get my kind of my, my foundation solid to where um, I could be competitive in like, in like the distance shots, just cause I feel, I figured I didn't want to be playing events where there would be, you know, a handful of holes at, at, at a tournament where I couldn't even body it. And I just didn't, didn't want to have that disadvantage. So I, I tried to get my, my technique solid and then um, started working on putting and th- putting and things like that. And then by the time I entered my false tournament, I had a, a decent game already. So when I entered the PGA in 2019, it wasn't it wasn't like I was brand new to the game, but you know definitely yeah. new to the competitive side. And and I, I realized like in my false tournament, I was like, wow, my game is so much worse than I expected. So I had a lot of things to <laughs> okay. work on just just from that false event. Pretty pretty humbling experience. Yeah, well, and you definitely you were able to have some success pretty early on. Um, you you pretty pretty quickly were able to win the South Dakota uh, State Championship. You took down some other events, and uh, it kind of gained you some traction in the sport pretty quickly. Not only due to your success out there on the um, in the tournament scene, but also due to the touring lifestyle that you brought into play. Uh, touring out of your O9 Prius um, certainly made some disc golf headlines. Uh, it was funny because. On a foundation podcast at one point, you know, we, uh, Hunter and I were kind of commentating about the, the touring lifestyle and disc golf and how it's, you know, it's so difficult. And we, we said, we literally, we hadn't even heard of you at this point. Cause this is before, like right when you were getting onto the scene and getting into the YouTube. And we yeah. mentioned that, uh, like players 
like we we said it like we thought we were making an exaggeration. We said like there's probably players trying to tour out of a, their Prius right now, and then you've got some players flying to events, and we had yeah. no idea. And then people were commenting like, "Are you making fun of Ezra? Like, how dare you?" And we we're like, "Wait, what? There's somebody doing this?" So it led me to, us to like research this and be like, "Oh, there's like a guy out there, you know, touring out of his Prius." But then you know, people people may just hear that phrase, and if you're listening to this right now. If you just you hear the word oh you know Ezra tore out his Prius you may think like wow that's really that's really rough in it and it was definitely a stretch but go and watch on Ezra's YouTube channel just the way you engineered that Prius because I was blown away like you got I don't think I've ever seen anybody get as much out of a vehicle as you were able to get out of that how long did it take you to perfect that system that you made with within that car um, to be honest, I kind of studied a decent amount about how I wanted to do it before I even started like building it out. Cause those people, okay. those people on YouTube, you know, that, that have lived in Priuses or other vehicles or whatever. So I was able to kind of learn a lot, um, from other YouTubers on how to kind of do it. So then by the time I actually built it out, I mean, I don't know, I had to get the window covers and I had to get the inverter, um, and everything else. So it's probably maybe like a month process to where I got everything kind of situated. And then yeah, I jumped in the jumped in the Prius and and lived in that for like twelve months. Which yeah, <laughs> that was an experience. I mean, not not as comfortable as you know the RV now, but um, definitely, definitely, yeah, definitely a cool experience. Yeah. Do you do you still own the Prius? Do you still have it? I don't. No. When I got the RV, I I, I got rid of the Prius, and so this is my <sighs> only good. Was that was that tough for you? Was there like some attachment there? I I mean yeah, I mean obviously like I lived with that thing for for a few years, and you know it kind of became part of my brand and things like that. So. Um, I don't know. I, I don't really get too attached to things emotionally, so it wasn't too difficult. Um, and to swap it out for this thing, it was kind of, you know, wasn't the most right. difficult thing. So having the RV now, like, what are the, what was, like, immediately the first amenities that stood out to you as, like, wow, this is such a huge advantage? I mean, obviously, there's probably plenty, but what are the really big ones? Yeah, I mean, obviously, having more space um, was is super nice just to, have, to be able to stand up and, like, sit at a table, sit on the couch. Um, or yeah. just the size of the bed, you know, I obviously in the Prius, it's a little bit crammed. So to have right. like a queen size bed in this thing, um, was super nice. Uh, and then to have like a full kitchen, you know, to cook, cook my beans or whatever else in the instant pot. Um, and a fridge, having a fridge is, is nice too. It definitely opens up, you know, the possibility of making smoothies or having greens oh, yeah. or things like that. So that, that, that was another one. I will so. say, I think my favorite feature of the Prius, um, and like I said, you got to go watch this if you haven't seen it yet, if you're listening. Um, but my favorite feature was the fact that not only did you, like, obviously you had the inverter to be able to use your Instapot to cook the beans, but the fact that you had a switch to go to your front seat so you could turn it off while you were still driving, like, that's that, that's amazing. Like, that involved, that should be in an engineering museum somewhere, that that, that system. Um that was that was definitely great. So I, I mean, I was gonna ask if you ever missed the Prius, like the nostalgia of it. But since you sold it, I'm guessing you probably are like good riddance to that thing. I mean, I definitely miss certain aspects about it. You know, um, just to be able to drive around a, like a town and not have to like always be like worrying about if I'm gonna hit something. True. Uh, while true. parking spots, things like that. Prius definitely came in clutch. Um, but I've I've kind of gotten used to it with the RV, and you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Like, how steep is the learning curve with driving an RV? Like. Were you terrified when you first got it of wrecking it? Definitely a little bit, you know. I mean, it's it's like I don't own it, so it's like I don't want to mess anything up. Um, yeah. I, I've had some experience with like driving pickups and pulling like a fifth wheel before, um, okay. so I, I knew a little bit about how to drive like you know bigger vehicles. Um, but yeah, it's it's I don't know. Definitely, definitely a lot different than driving a, a normal sized vehicle. And I have to park like right now. I parked at a hotel, but I parked like you know width wise. I'm taking up like four spots. So it definitely can be a little bit difficult trying to find places to park sometimes. Yeah, a- absolutely. Um, another thing I kind of wanted to talk about a little bit that you know is still a part of your touring lifestyle is your diet because obviously yeah. it's super unique. Your diet and fitness regimen is probably one of the like outside of your disc golf game. It's one of the things that you're kind of known for these days. Uh, it's just the discipline that you have with your with your diet and your fitness. Um, one thing that people probably might, might not know is that you have actually been a vegan, you know, plant based eater since you were a toddler. Talk a little bit about how that kind of came into play, and then like what kind of role that kind of had in your childhood. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's it's kind of the only experience that I have. You know, I've only lived one life, so it's kind of all I know. Uh, but yeah, my my parents went vegan or plant based, or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think like right when I was born, maybe, maybe when I was one years old. So I, I've been, I've been plant-based my whole life and, you know, 
obviously, you know, fitness and diet are, are kind of important to me. It's kind of it's kind of a hobby now too. Do I? Yeah, I enjoy staying in shape and, and trying to be healthy, and um, I think it obviously it helps disc golf as well. Um, but yeah, it's 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 you know I've, I've never been like not vegan, so I can't like compare it to that. I've I've tried some some like normal food here and there, but nothing's really made me want to kind of you know swap over. So it's it's you know. I've- yeah. Of all the non-vegan foods you've tried, like which is—is is there any that like stood out to you and that you like remember? Like, oh yeah, that one was pretty good. Or are they all kind of just been like, ah, eh, that's all right. Don't really need that. Yeah, it, it'd probably be sweets, maybe. Um, but that's kind of a hack answer because like you can make vegan sweets kind of taste the same. It's mostly just sugar anyway. Uh, um, yeah, Oreo I, cookies I are know. vegan, so <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. Um, I've had some decent, I've tried like, I tried chicken wings and Jones and there's a place called wings to go. That's kind of a, a go-to spot. I tried one okay. of their wings. That was, that was pretty good. Um, well, there was like a, there was this place called, um, there was this place in Salt Lake city called pretty Bowl, I think. And I tried a chicken sandwich and that was, that was okay. pretty good. Too. But that like had all the breading on it and stuff too. So I don't know if yeah. I liked, if I liked the meat, if I just liked everything else. But. Right. Well, that, I, listen, I, I yeah, I certainly prescribe. I, I I totally get the plant-based lifestyle. My sister, as well as my mom, uh, eat vegan almost. Well, my sister entirely. My mom pretty much entirely. Um, so I grew up, um, especially the later part of my childhood, eating a lot of plant-based. Um, and I so I totally get it. And I I loved all the foods really involved in it. But for the people that listen, and obviously, like if you're listening right now and you're gonna like talk smack about the vegan lifestyle, just like look at the guy we're talking to right now. Clearly it's working, but give your pitch right now. Like for those who kind of like the biggest thing you hear, and I'm sure you hear it all the time is like, Oh, you don't eat meat. So where do you get your protein from? Yeah. So like, what is, what, what's the, what do you say to the people that are, that say things like that to you? Like, well, how do you get like the protein you need in your diet? Yeah. I mean, like all protein comes from plants. So even animals that eat other animals, the animals that they eat, eat plants, you know, so that the, all protein comes from plants to begin with. Um, and then obviously there's tons of animals that eat plants and all, you know, super strong. Um, and yeah, it's just, yeah. I mean, I eat a lot of beans, so obviously that that's kind of where I get the, the yeah. majority of my protein. But, um, also another thing is like, you don't need as much protein as people typically think, um, unless you're like, you know, walking out all the time and trying to be like a massive bodybuilder or something like that. You really don't need that much protein, and it can kind of do more harm than good. So I th- the whole protein thing is a little bit of a, of a myth, I think. Uh, okay. Wow. All yeah. right. Um, yeah. Well, I, and I know, like, obviously the beans is, like, the big thing in your diet. Um, yeah. When you were kind of doing the, the Prius tour, like, you know, you showed, you know, cooking the beans. And that's obviously been, like, the staple in your diet. But has, has your diet, like, expanded much at all, or is it pretty still, t- like – is it pretty much still centered around the beans or is there anything that you've kind of added in? That's like a consistent part. It's sta- yeah, it stayed pretty well consistent. Beans are still kind of the staple for me. Um, but like this season I've been having a smoothie, like a berry smoothie almost every day. And then I've been having, um, a lot of like tofu, cucumber, um, like lettuce, spinach sandwiches as well. Um, so that's, okay. like, that's been kind of a good addition too to get some, get some leafy greens in my diet. Yeah, definitely. And as far as the beans, I know Pinto is your favorite, but do you ever eat other ones or do you pretty much just stick to the Pinto? We've actually been mixing it up a lot. So like the last well, month or so. So what's so yeah, so what's yeah. the bean power ranking then? That's what I need. Wow. <laughs> I want like I want like that's... top top three or top five beans. Like that's that, that's what the people okay. want to hear. I think I've got to go Pinto number one. Probably black Absolutely. bean number two. Okay, um, I'm with you. Let's go, let's go like like a red kidney bean number three. I'm going to go Dark yes. Horse Mayakoba bean, if you've ever heard of that. And Happen. then another bean you maybe have ever heard of, a cranberry bean. So I haven't heard of yeah. that one either. We'll just go to Walmart, and they've got like 10 different kinds of beans. So we'll just get like all the different kinds and mix them up and, yeah, and cook them up. So okay. they've all got like a just, little, bit, little bit different makeup. So a little, little bit different yeah. health benefits, I guess. Does garbanzo bean qualify? Like, does that ever make its way into the mix? I think, I think it does qualify. It doesn't really, I don't know. It kind of takes away the the taste for me if I add if I add garbanzo beans into the like the beans it takes away from the Mexican feel so we don't add okay. garbanzo beans typically but is that that's typically like the flavor profile you're going going for yeah kind of I mean I add hot sauce okay. on them that's kind of what I taste anyway so right. I know I know you usually like eat them with like tortillas or uh, tortilla chips as well like that's typically yeah. the way 
the vessel. Yeah. But I, I'm telling you, I think this interview is going to be all I needed. But like, I'm going to do the Ezra diet, and I'm going to do it yeah. for like a month. And okay. I really need to because I think it'd be great to experience. Uh, I don't know if I can stick to the same fitness routine, but uh, I definitely I want to try the box because like I love beans, like, but I've never okay. like tried to exercise the discipline to just eat the like would you just like because would you describe yourself as like a foodie like are you do you think of yourself as somebody that really enjoys a lot of foods or do you kind of think like you're sort of blessed with the mindset of like i really just like eating simple things and i don't i'm not like super into food because like it's it's tough for me to yeah. imagine sticking to that diet right yeah i definitely wouldn't say i'm a foodie i mean i i, I kind of enjoy good tasting food you know it's not like i want to eat bland food but i just yeah. don't me all that much you know it's like i eat it and then like after i'm done eating it i can't taste it anymore so i don't know it's not like the food i, I the, the food i eat i do like you know so it's not too boring but i mean yeah. yeah i think trying to like transition to the way i eat would probably be pretty difficult just because most people are used to kind of having variety and eating food that they like right. all the time so try, try to eat like kind of the same exact meals every single day i think would be probably a challenge but i don't know taste, taste buds do change so you know after a while i think you probably would get used to it yeah, be, definitely. Be, well, yeah. along with the diet, uh, obviously you have a pretty intense and disciplined workout routine as well. Um, I went through and watched the the videos that you have on your the different routines you did. Uh, and so talk a little bit about, though, you know, obviously the, if you're listening and you want to know how Ezra works out, he has it on his YouTube channel. You can, you can check that out and see like more of his individual routines, but talk about like your fitness journey in general, you know, what age did you start taking it seriously and you know, what kind of, what, what led you to getting into shape and, and wanting to make that a part of your lifestyle? Yeah. So I, I actually started like competitive swimming when I was like nine years old. So I kind of yeah. got a little bit in shape uh, from that. And I kind of just, I liked the way my body, my body started to look and I, I wanted to be, I wanted a good physique. So, um, started lifting weights when I was maybe like 15 or 16, not, not super intensively. Um, but yeah, I just, I kind of liked, liked the growth that I saw and, and the, the ability to kind of improve myself, you know? So I, I like that aspect of it. Um, and then I got more serious with it kind of, kind of right when I started taking disc golf more seriously too, just because before that, you know, walking on houses or doing construction walk the old, the old before, didn't have as much freedom to have time to even, you know, lift weights or anything like that. So when I started taking disc golf seriously, it's kind of when I started putting a lot more time into fitness and, and working out five, six days a week um, to, to really build the physique. Yeah, definitely. And do you feel that, I, I will say, like, as somebody who, I've gone through stints working out, but have certainly never reached, like, any kind of potential physique that I could achieve with a serious, disciplined routine, and I've always wondered, you know, I've played disc golf for, you know, a decade, thrown so many shots. I've worked on my technique, but you always kind of have in the back of your head when you're somebody like me, like, mm, like, I wonder if, if I could take my distance to a next level, if I, if I worked out and really got into shape, what do you feel the role of fitness and disc golf is? Do you th like, what do you think, like starting at, at your base before you really got serious with fitness and then getting mm -hmm. to where you are now, do you see, think there's going to be or do you think there has been like a serious jump in your distance or do you think it really has a lot more to do with technique? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's tough to say how much of a role my fitness has, has played in that just because when I started take, like when I started really working on, on technique back in 2017, um, my physique wasn't quite where it is now, but also my distance was trash. And then, so like, like putting it, like for those, those two years, I built up my physique, but I also built up my technique okay. at the same time. Um, yeah. So it's kind of hard to say how much of a, of, a, of an impact it's, it's had. I think it, it probably does help some. It is hard to say though because if you look at a lot of the other like long long drive throwers on tour, a lot of them are, are pretty just kind of tall and skinny and flexible, and then yeah. obviously have, have really good technique. So I think I think technique at the end of the day plays a much a much larger role. Um, but I think I think you know having having muscles and um, and things like that helps too. And it's it's probably almost a more important thing from like, um, injury prevention, maybe more so than, mm -hmm. than like distance. Yeah, definitely. And another thing I was kind of curious about is cause you mentioned in your workout routine videos that, and at least this was as true as, as of December of last year, but you kind of structure a lot of your workouts. Um, uh, I believe it was, and correct me if I'm wrong, high hypotrophy. Is that the correct word I'm using there? Yeah. Hypotrophy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. So you were trying to basically gain size was, was your goal and, and plan yeah. your reps accordingly. Do you think that, 
as you continue, if you keep getting bigger and getting stronger, do you think at any point that if you get too bulky that it could actually negatively affect your disc golf game? Um, if I'm being honest, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I think it's probably impossible to get like too big unless I start jumping on steroids or something. So as long as I okay. stay natural, it's not like, I, I don't think I'm going to put on too much more size in my upper body. I think my legs can go a little bit. Um, but it's like, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think I'm going to be able to get to, to the point where I'm too big to, um, like, like, you know, shortening my throw or getting in the way of myself, uh, naturally at least. Yeah, definitely. And why, well, and it seems like uh, at this point, um, it, so a lot of it you'd feel like is more like maintaining what you've got in with the upper yeah. body really more than anything. Yeah. Um, definitely, definitely. Well, I wanted to kind of jump over to a, another topic, um, getting back sort of to that timeline where you were kind of first bursting onto the disc golf scene. So obviously you had a pretty successful first attempt at the tour in 2020 and your name really started circulating a lot and you kind of became the first, I don't want to say the first free agency hype in disc golf because there had been some things like that before, but it was really one of the first ones where a, you hadn't had a sponsor or manufacturer sponsor previously and B, um, it really got a lot of coverage. And I think it was just a time in disc golf where we were looking for things to cover. There was kind of that boom in the sport. And there was also a lull in competitive disc golf. Um, and you really got to the forefront of the free agency news, people wondering where you were going to sign. You were kind of the big fish on the market. Talk a little about like what it was like, you know, going from just a guy who's touring in his Prius, trying to make this disc golf thing work to somebody who's, like essentially, you know, being courted by all these companies, like in your, everybody's wondering where you're going to go. You kind of feel like you're the next big ticket item in disc golf. Like, what was that like, you know, feeling that? Yeah. I mean, it was pretty, pretty crazy. Obviously the, I don't know. Yeah. It was, it just, it kind of happened pretty fast. You know, I didn't expect, expect that, that much buzz kind of just right, right off the bat. Um, but yeah, I think we got, I got kind of lucky, you know, Nate Pawkins helped me a lot with, with, you know, all the discussions and things like that. And he, he kind of helped give me the advice to kind of hold off that fall season. Cause I think mid season, maybe around D glow time, um, we did have a company kind of talk to me and, 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 and show interest. Um, but he yeah. was kind of like, you know, let's just let the season play out. Let's see how you finish. Um, and then, you know, then we can assess and we can probably get, get all the people to kind of interested in, and maybe, maybe build some competition within the brands. Um, and I think that was really good advice for me at the time. And, um, yeah, so to, to have, to have the companies interested and to build, build that hype and, and kind of tease, you know, make little Instagram posts here and there, kind of teasing where I was going to maybe go. I had, a lot, right. I had a lot of fun with that, and I think that kind of helped create hype as well and and get some more people interested, in, uh, you know, as well. So that was just that was, that was, was yeah. Fun. And having multiple companies interested in you at once, did you, did it feel a little overwhelming at times, like trying to to kind of sort through where you were going to sign with, or did it feel, or were you pretty confident early on that Discraft was going to be the choice for you? Yeah, I mean. It was definitely a tough decision. You know, obviously my bag was already like, you know, halfways discraft and I liked the company. I liked kind of the excitement that they had going for them. And so there was a lot of positives I saw with this craft, but at the same time, I saw a lot of positives with other companies too. And, you know, other offers were very incentivizing. And so those, it was, it was definitely tough to kind of decipher which positives were the most positive, you know, and kind of, kind right. of see, try to figure out where I would fit the best and, and kind of what would be the best move for longevity and trying to think, you know, in advance, not just take maybe the most money right off the bat trying to kind of, you know, pick a company that I can build with and, and move forward with. So there was definitely a lot of things to consider on it. Definitely took us a while and we wanted to make the right move. And, and in the end, Discraft, I think was that move. And it's been, it's been great since. Yeah, definitely. I think you've, you've definitely seen some success, uh, kind of jump leapfrogging off of their branding and using their social media and everything. And I think it's definitely been a good pairing. Um, but we're definitely gonna be rooting for you the rest of the season, Ezra. I'm sure there's going to be some wins in your future. Um, the game is looking pretty sharp. So thank you so much for joining the show. We really appreciate you having you on. Thanks, man. Thanks again for inviting me on, man. I enjoyed it. All right. Thanks again to Ezra for joining the show. It was awesome to hear from him on all the things he's got going on this season. And we're definitely wishing him the best of luck. Stay tuned um, on all my social accounts because I think I'm going to be trying the Ezra diet for a week to see what it does to me. I had Ezra uh, send me over a list of everything that he eats specifically, and I think I'm going to give it a shot. So make sure to look out for that. But uh, we're going to have an awesome guest next Thursday, so make sure to be here for that. We'll see you then. (laughs) 